Well, I, uh, you know, everybody says the two favorite words in sports is game seven. And I say the people that say that clearly have no rooting interest in the game, because if your team is playing in a game seven, these are not your favorite words because every single second of the game is a heart attack. Uh, but yet, alas, we are headed to another game seven in these Eastern Conference playoffs. Evan Valenti back here on Southern Speed alongside Seth Lamon, formerly of ESPN, as we give a little, we, we decompress a little bit after game six. Boston loses 111 and 113. We will set the stage for game seven, Sunday, 8 30. Uh, I guess pregame shows, you know, sort of start time. Tip will be more towards 840 if you're really sometime around time. midnight. <laughs> yeah, the game will get over at like, you know, 1130. We'll see how it goes. But before we get into game seven, again, 830 ESPN, we're going to vent a little bit about game six because a lot happened in that particular game. A lot of maddening things happened in that game. Um, we're alongside Seth Lamon, who is uh, frequently on this show, giving crazy stats. I have poured myself a glass of scotch to help things go down a little bit easier here. I was going to do the same, and I totally forgot to do it. McAllen 12. <laughs> nice birthday gift. And I totally. put rocks in it just so I don't get hammered here on this show. We all we need to get through these moments as best we can. And it's can I just say it's nice, so nice to be here with you without Adam. I, I mean, yeah. you and I can both get a word in edgewise now. It's more it's more a little more balanced at this point instead of just listening to Kaufman rant the entire time. I'm forgetting <laughs> about this, Adam, by the way. I wouldn't say bad things about Adam uh, when Never. on the show. I would just do it to his face. Uh, Adam's uh, again, another well-deserved vacation for Adam. We'll be back next week. Um, hopefully I'll be there. It's been a while for me. I've just been crazy with work. Adam's been holding it down by himself. Um, I'm glad he gets a little time off though. It's been crazy, but Seth, absolutely. 111, 103, lot to get to about the loss. Boston had a, had a golden opportunity, despite the fact that this game was, you know, Miami got out to an early good lead enough to, you know, set the pace, keep Boston at bay, but Boston climbed all the way back. This has been something that, you know, if you look go back to the earlier part of the season and earlier iterations of Celtics teams, um, you know, it wasn't something they're totally capable of. Boston climbs all the way back. And if you go to the last three minutes of this game, Boston just has a complete meltdown while Miami mm-hmm. takes control here. 94-94 with 5.30 to go. Horford ties the game on a three. Finally, Horford hits his only three in the basketball game. And then White hits the three not too long later. Boston up 97-94. This is where... <laughs> Things get a little dicey right now. Um, credit to Miami, and we'll get into a couple of things, but Miami's going to hit a couple of really tough shots towards the end of this game. Lowry hits a, a late clay, uh, a late shot clock three. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have some free throws to get exchanged. Jalen Brown hits two. I think uh, Jimmy Butler hit a couple as well. Boston turns the ball over a few times. They miss some threes. Then it gets to the Jalen missed the free throws, which, mm-hmm. as we all know, took the energy out of the building. On the flip side, Butler gets an and one on Horford at the rim. You know, a great job by Butler to get downhill, attacks Horford's body, finishes through the contact, tough shot, and one. Butler, you know, knocks that in. Celtics turn the ball over. Tucker hits a, hits a, a couple of free throws, sends Miami up five. Boston misses a three. And then with under a minute left, the shot that iced it, and this was just a microcosm of the game, with two point what two point nine two point four on the shot clock under a minute, right. Jimmy gets the ball in the right corner, turn around jumper at like barely inside the three point line and cans that one impossible that, shot that and that's the ball game right there and I know it's like. We have a little group chat going where I, 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 I say a lot of like simple things. And I know the game of basketball is a little more complicated, but we, you know, at the end of the day, it's a make or miss league. And at the end of the game, Boston flat out either didn't hit shots or turned the ball over in Miami. As much as you want to gripe about certain things, like Miami just hit a bunch of tough shots in this game, Seth. They did. And Boston on the flip side, missed shots, turned the ball over Tatum, especially at the late in the game and, and just Boston withered the game away. And, and it just, reminds us of the earlier Celtics team that just had that just when they were down a billion had no chance to come back. It just reminds us a little bit of that earlier season Celtics team. Yeah. You know what I was thinking? Um, 
like there are these I, I'm the kind of person when I think about sports, I I try so hard to be like really analytical about everything and like try to like like I question my emotions a lot as they're happening. But it really this was the kind of game where it felt like every time the Celtics like they would like scratch and claw their way back and then Miami would just like pull something like really heroic out like really making like big shots in big moments like to stem these runs and actually the one I really wanted to talk about was that the when Jimmy got the and one over Horford because like that was like another one of these plays where down the stretch they're like they're worried about Jimmy and they're trying to keep Marcus on Jimmy or specifically they're trying to make sure Derek White doesn't get switched on to him and and you get it because like Jimmy's making like 18 footers over like over tough defense anyway. Um, But I think on that play, like the Celtics fear of Jimmy Butler, like get their their fear of him exploiting a mismatch gave him like this clear runway to the rim. And, and like on a play like that, where there's no resistance along the way, it just feels like that's like Horford can do a lot, but that's asking too much for him to like, stop a freight train coming at him in in that moment and even that like jimmy finished through tough contact like al was there like straight up and and there was body contact and like even with that jimmy finished it and it and like yeah no it's not it it wasn't like he was like in game one of this series and maybe even a little bit game two it felt as a Celtics fan watching the game it sort of felt like jimmy was like grifting a lot of calls in this game it just felt like Man, this guy's a killer. He's yeah. just destroying us right now. Like, like even if that play isn't an and one, Jimmy made that bucket over like really tough defense. Yeah, and it's it's you know in the playoffs, sometimes let it go, sometimes not. It's a you know judgment call whether that's yeah. an and one or not. And I don't have a problem with it because if that were Tatum on the other end, I'd want the foul call. So yeah, you yeah. can't be like a guy that's like, well, why do you call a foul on that play? Where if the other, I'm screaming like, why are you finish through contact? So I can't be the guy that's like, you know, going to get it. But that was in that play. Exactly. You know, they have a, uh, they have smart guarding Jimmy really far away from the basket. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean like 30 feet out and, and smart clearly I, isn't a hundred percent. I mean, smart yeah. Jimmy abused smart pretty much all game long. I forget who had the stat, but Jimmy did a, a tremendous job basically on everybody that guarded him. Not <laughs> a great guy. game for our beloved defensive player of the year though. Yeah, right. no, it That's wasn't. Good. And Marcus is clearly hindered by something, but smart meets him way out, you know, top of the key, like 30 feet away. They run that. I think it's, I think it's either Struess or Lowry that comes over to set the screen. So they get that Derek white matchup and Derek white, so like smart kind of covers towards the middle of the floor to try and push him towards the baseline and white, like was angled the wrong way. And when you're angled the wrong way, like Jimmy yeah. is just going to go. And I, and I was going to save this for later, but this, this guy on Twitter, I watched it just very recently. Um, it was really good. I want to make sure I get it. Brady Hawks on, hmm. on Twitter. He had a breakdown of some of the stuff that Jimmy was doing in the game. And, I, and we'll get to more of it probably a little bit later. Um, but on that play, he, he demonstrates like he's like Jimmy saw a lot of wide open space, which he usually doesn't see against this Boston defense. And he saw that Al basically had two feet in the paint. Yep, was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to I'm just going to run right at him. And, and again, Jimmy's good at creating contact, finishing through contact, but at least ma- putting the game in the rest hands to decide like you're going to call something or not. And, you know, to Jimmy's credit, they did. And he finished through the shot anyway. It was just one of those things where Jimmy made a really quick decision. Yeah. And was able to get downhill without any resistance. And if, and it's crazy because Horford is just, is a really good defender pretty much anywhere. I've started listening to Simmons and Rosillo and Kevin O'Connor. They talked about how Al, and maybe it was them or maybe it was somebody else, how Al, maybe it was Zach Lowe. Again, all these podcasts blur <laughs> together at this point because <laughs> they're all coming out every other day, basically. But somebody was talking about how Al is really good at forcing people to move laterally instead of vertically. And Al, you know, basically stepped up and just tried to block off, you know, Jimmy from getting a dunk. But Jimmy, again, with his length, finishes a little bit around Al and absorbs the body contact and finishes through. It was a, it was a wonderful, wonderful play. Um, but, you know, even with that, even with Jimmy's shot like that, like Boston at the end of that game, just like basically 
pissed down their leg and, and had no no response to all these haymakers that the Heat were throwing. You got to remember, like this Heat team, you know, it's got a bunch of older guys on it that mm-hmm. have gone to the NBA Finals. Like Jimmy's like the least accomplished person on this team, which is a really weird thing to say because Lowry has a ring, and so it's PJ Tucker. Yeah, but like those two guys are tough as hell. As much as you want to grip about certain things, like those two guys are tough. They're smart. They're veteran players. Yeah, they're and, champs. Yeah, and Jimmy just, you know, has the will of a champion. Whether he's won it or not, like, doesn't matter. He still has the will of it. And Boston, on the, on the flip side, turns the ball over and misses shots. Boston didn't shoot well in this game particularly well at all, if you look yeah. at anybody outside of Derek White. But, you know, they just – they just whatever they needed a, a bucket, they either turned it over or took a bad shot, and, and Miami didn't. And even if they took a bad shot, they hit it. And that's, yeah. that's the game right there. I hate I, – I know we all spent all this time, like, analyzing plays and things, but – like to me, Seth, it's that simple. I think it is. I, one of the stats I was looking up after the game, cause I've been feeling so frustrated about like what is going on with the Celtics. Like why do they have these games, like these giant turnover games, or it just feels like it's like this real roller coaster. And it's true. Like Miami in this series, when they shoot, so like their effective field goal percentage for this, for the playoffs, I think is like somewhere around 52%. And in the series, when they're over 52%, they're three and O when they're under 52%, they're 0 and 3, you know? And like with the Celtics, it's it ain't like that. It's like we're the Celtics are winning, they won a game where they were down at like 45% effective field goal percentage. I think which was that? That was game four. And but they also like um they lost a game where they were up at like 57 for effective field goal percentage. So like I think with the Celtics, it's like they they have like so many different like things that need to, that like can go right or can go wrong, depending on like mood or something. Whereas like the heat are just like generating the same shots kind of, I think from game to game. And they're like, they had, they happen to in games four and five of this series have these like what now feel to me like historically unlucky shooting nights, like just absurd like absurdly low percentages on three pointers and every other jump shot they took. Um, And maybe that, maybe those are just outliers. And like, the truth is like, there's been three games in this series where the heat have scored really efficiently and they've won all three of them. So it's like, I don't know. Can, are there things the Celtics can do to prevent that? Or are we just like hoping that the heat win? I've kind of gotten to a point with the Celtics team where I don't know what to expect from game to game. Nobody does in this series. It's yeah. It's nobody like the line right now is minus two and a half, but for who? For Boston. <laughs> really? And yeah, that's weird by the way. Yeah. Um, but the road. there's, there's no rhyme or reason to any of these games. It's just a, it's a coin flip on whether it's a blowout or a close game feel more have been more than blowouts. And it's a coin flip on who wins because every, every night's a whole different story. And you have, I, I, it's so hard to get feel like in the seven game series against the box. Mm-hmm. And it was like, okay, we know how this is going to go. Milwaukee is going to let Boston shoot threes. Yep. They're gonna let, well, certain guys are going to let Grant shoot. They're going to let Marcus shoot. They're not going to let Tatum or Brown kill him as much from three, but they're going to leave guys open because they're willing to die by that shot. And Boston is going to have open looks. It's just a matter of them knocking them down. Yeah. You know, similarly, you go back to the Brooklyn series. It was Boston is very willing to let Bruce Brown hit threes. Like he can shoot as much as he wants. As long as it's not Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, like who cares? Yeah. In this series, it's like, I don't, other than Jimmy Butler being a huge, you know, defensive responsibility for everybody and Jason Tatum and PJ Tucker going at it on the other side, there really is just not a lot of – these are two head coaches that do a really good job of trying to screw up the other guy. And yeah. not to be weird or anything and not, and not to just, you know, you know talk down Eme because Eme has been – I mean, Eme, Eme is amazing. He's That's been great. I, I, I was thinking about potentially what to talk about if Boston were at a – have won game six. And I honestly really wanted to start with Eme because of the ride this team has been on the past couple of years and how Eme has really – Changed so many things, but at the end of game six, like I, I kind of feel like Spo caught Ime with his pants down a little bit because at the end of the game, you how do how Tatum and Brown only have two combined shots in the fourth quarter? That's a mistake. 
And that's got to be on somebody, whether that's whether that's Brown and Tatum themselves or on Eme not putting them in positions to succeed. I feel like all three of them have to wear it. And so when you talk, look at all six games, you have two head coaches that are really playing chess here. Yeah. Spo is arguably the best of them all. I mean, I, I know, you know, you know, Steve Kerr's a great coach and Popovich is a great coach and you go up and down the line. Spo is incredible with what he's able to do with his team. And at the end of games, his teams like don't wither away. They get stronger. Yeah, no, it feels like his teams are always incredibly well prepared. I, I guess I, I was wondering, like, I, I don't feel necessarily like the um, like crunch time of game six was, is necessarily on Ime. I, I guess I am sort of wondering what you think, like Tatum and Brown are catching a lot of flack, I think today for the, low amount of field goal attempts in the second half for me watching down the stretch I kept thinking about something Van Gundy said during the broadcast which is like he was I think he was praising Derek White at the time uh, and maybe Horford too and he said guys like this are valuable because sometimes you need to move the ball just for the sake of moving it and I think this thing happens to the Celtics. I think this is, to me, this is a big piece of what's wrong with them in crunch time, like over the course of the season, is that they, um, they're they trying so hard to do the, like, the smart, right thing that they, like, um, that they struggle, I think, to adjust when the defense takes away the thing they're trying to do. And so, like, we've seen in the last few games of this series, like, three out of the last four games, the Celtics have had it like way too many turnovers. And I think part of that is um, these moments where like uh, the ones up at the top of the key where they're trying to like force the ball back to Tatum after the pick or, um, or whatever it is trying to enter the ball into the post, the heat are, are covering the passes the Celtics want to make. And the Celtics kind of do this thing like that where they stare down the pass and then they just kind of make it anyway, most of the time. Um, or they like down the stretch, I think a thing that was happening is like, um, Marcus or Derek white will try to get the ball to Tatum and Tatum won't for whatever reason, he'll like, he'll come up from the, uh, from under the basket and he'll, um, he'll try to make himself available and use his body to get open. And Miami's shutting that off. And then, um, we, the Celtics just don't know what to do. And I, I don't know, like, what's your read on why do you think, why is it so hard to get for them to get the ball where they want to get the ball? Are they just like not because being Miami's creative really enough? Miami's really good at preventing that. I go back to Scal and Lowe were on the low post, obviously. Mm-hmm. And I, I only remember this because I listened to it recently on accident because I was walking my dog. And I had finished the low post in the way I'm a, I'm old school. I guess I'm a dinosaur. I listen to podcasts on, on the, the Apple podcast app instead of. I do too. Spotify. Fellow dinosaur. Yeah. I, whatever. I don't care. Like don't no don't judge me, but I was, it, it rifled through like the end of a couple of episodes in a row, but I had gone back and listened to scowl and low on something and it, it i caught it at the right time and scal was like I, the one thing i'm worried about boston and i just happened to catch him at this point was he's like miami's really good at being like no you're not gonna do what you want to do you're gonna do what we want you to do on offense like you yep. want to go this way we're gonna make sure you can't and you have to go this way and if you go that way we are gonna have someone there waiting for you to make sure you move the ball to this point where we also have something waiting for you. And it was sort of something I'm getting, I'm sort of paraphrasing, but it was something well, like that to that effect. So I, yeah, that's exactly what I've been thinking. And um, I remember when he said that actually, and, and I think the answer, really the right. answer, the answer to that problem though, in basketball is, is improvisation. It's like, and, and I think the biggest problem the Celtics have it's not that they're not good at improvisation. I think we saw it tons of times, especially over the second half of the season where the ball movement was like really beautiful and shots were coming from kind of unpredictable places, like in the flow of just like smart players, make, making smart decisions in real time. Right. But they they are not good at that under high stress. Like they're good at that when they're like coming back from like being way down. Like when, when, when like all the, when everything sucks, and they like run out of like reasons to think they're still in the game. It almost feels like they loosen up and they get back in it just by kind of moving it and playing free. 
I think when they're thinking too hard, it's hard. And then the other problem, and this is like the other like stat thing I wanted to bring up here is like, they are just playing way, way too slow in the moments where no one's guarding them, like walking the ball up the court or just getting into their offense. Like they are starting these possessions so late in the clock that then when the first thing you try doesn't work, you don't have time to do anything else. That's why Marcus Smart shot nine threes last night is because he got the ball with like eight seconds or less on the shot clock. And there's not time to like run a whole play anymore. Like at that point, you just, you got to like hope your rebounders are in a position to maybe have a shot at it and hope your shot goes in. But so I looked up some stats and like average time to shot in the regular season. Do you know this website in, in predictable? Have you looked at this? Yeah, I haven't looked at it, but I know the website. Yeah. So uh, during the regular season, we were 12.1 seconds per possession, like average time to shot. In the playoffs, it's 12.9, so almost a whole second slower. And, and like, in terms of how that ranks, it's, like, we're not fast in the regular season. We were 21st out of 30 teams. But in the playoffs, it's 18th out of 20. So it's, like, okay. it's worse. Yeah. So then, and after makes, we're a full second slower, 15.5 to 16.5. Um, in transition and after defensive rebounds, we're basically the same. Like, we're still, like, playing fast, kind of. So, like... I think that's the other thing that comes into play with the shooting thing is like when these other, when these teams that we're playing, that the Celtics are playing against make shots, the Celtics get into their whole walk it up thing. But then this is the one that really killed me. So after offensive rebounds, we're like 17th out of 20 teams. It takes us four seconds. And if you think about how many p- offensive rebounds just like lead to putbacks, like, four seconds is just like way too long. And it was 3.5 during the regular season. Like those are plays where there were a few down the stretch last night where we would get an offensive rebound. And on the broadcast, they were talking about the Celtics are so much bigger than the heat right now. And Miami like really needs to worry about the defensive glass. The Celtics would get these rebounds, but then in their, like in their attempt to sort of like pull it back out and run something, you can't do that. There's, there's just not enough time. Yeah, you and I are similar on this um, in in their little group chat that we have. I these offensive rebound nights kill me, and, and when Miami is killing Boston on the on the offensive glass. Well, yeah, that, that too. It absolutely kills me. If you go by game, uh, Miami won the first game nine to eight. That's a win for Miami. They won it twelve to eight in the second game. Boston somehow still wins. This shows you just this series is so out of, out of control. No, and three and four were okay, I think, right? Yeah, so three and four, Boston wins both offensive rebounding margins, but they got killed in game five, and yet still won that game. 19-6 to six on the offensive glass in game five. And then in game six, Miami won last night 11-6 to six in that category. And it felt – see, these always feel like way more to me. They always – like, I saw 11-6, and I was like, I thought it was like 20-1. to one. If I give you the percentage, it'll really scare you because the, the percentage they're rebounding in the last two games. It's the yeah. same percentage of both games. And it's exactly one third of their missed shots. The The heat are rebounding a third of their missed shots. Yeah. And I want to hold on to that for later. Yeah. Okay. What was one of my keys to game seven? Yeah. But, um, well, but what do you think about the speed thing? Like, I just think like, I would love to see them Well, they, like th- they're not being pressed full court. So I would love to see the Celtics like run the ball up, get the offense started at 20 seconds. Then when the heat gobble up the, like the stuff you try to do first, you have 10 or 12 seconds to get into your like subsequent actions. Okay. So how much of this, I don't mean to pivot in a different direction because I do think this is actually a very interesting conversation. <laughs> How much of this is that everybody in the court is absolutely shot right now? It's a good point. Because, I, I, I mean, I've been talking about it in other, other people that I know. Like, people – the NBA playoffs has been, a, a, you know, a lot of – it's been it's, – it's been at least a lot of vocal people talking yeah. about every game. I mean, you watch every game. It's been a lot of opinions, all this stuff. The one thing that I've, I've noticed is, like, if you watch this series specifically, and I didn't catch a ton of Golden State – in, in Dallas, because it's just too late at night. I'm like, I'm already, I'm already tired. Like, I can't do it. I can only do it for Boston. I can't do it every night until 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning. My life will suffer very much. I can only it's do it fair. It, it's fair, man. Your podcast is called Celtic Speed. It's all right. Yeah. But I do like to watch basketball. But, like, right now, I just, like, I don't have the energy to watch. 
I also, you know, I just don't have the energy to watch Golden State Dallas till 1 a.m. I'm just like, I'm tired. I can't do it anymore. I can't hang anymore. Yeah. But like, you watch this series, and like, one of the biggest things about the series is like, both of these teams are just shot. Mm-hmm. I mean, in especially like Jimmy doing what he did last night on one leg is just absolutely unbelievable. Kyle yeah. Lowry is obviously hurt and he killed him again last night. Yeah. Um, you have PJ Tucker's playing with at least, I think two injuries right now and he's still looks fine. Yeah. Um, Jason had that stinger. He seems to be okay. I think last night he looked great for the most part. I didn't, I didn't see any nagging injuries there. Smart's no, I would agree. Hobbled, okay. Smart's, Smart's clearly gotten through some stuff. Jalen's gotten through some stuff. Um, I would assume Al at 35 has probably got something going on. What is going on with Rob is a huge question. Like mm-hmm. these teams are just shot. And I think sometimes like as much as it drives me crazy that they roll the ball up the floor and they walk it up and they take seven of the eight seconds and almost like 7.8 seconds of the eight second clock to get over the timeline. Like they take so, but at some at points I'm like, they're literally doing this because they're absolutely exhausted. They're exhausted. And no, I think you're right. Goes. I mean, every, and, and they, and I always say this with Tatum because I was always on this, this point with Tatum with like, He's played so much basketball over the past two and a half years. Like at some point, like Jason is a machine. If you think about the durability of Tatum, it is actually insane how durable he has been throughout his short career. And I'm not going to all the wood. Human yeah, please. I can't right believe now. you even said it. But, well, can, can I just say though, in, in, in slight rebuttal to this, sure. like Miami is playing fast. Kyle Lowry is like old as dirt. And that guy is like, he catches the ball on a rebound and he immediately, how much did that outlet pass for the layup kill you? Like he's, he's like, not only is he like running the ball up the court, but he's like looking up and trying, like, just let, is there any little thing I can do to make life easier? And I think, I wonder if this is like a, as you get as maybe as these, this is like pure conjecture on my part here, but like my theory is, that veteran players in many cases actually start playing faster in the moments where no one's guarding them. Because like what happens if you slow down, if you walk the ball up the court to save energy, then the possession itself takes more energy. Like then you give Miami a chance to set their defense. Yeah. And that's what you want to do with one of the best defensive teams in the league. You don't. Yeah. And then you're like bumping bodies, which takes more energy. And then you're like, you're up again. You're up against the shot clock. How then, many like, times do you have how many the only pass I can remember in this series that you're talking about, the look ahead, like was smart chucked it to Jalen on like a fast break. And that's the only time they've tried that. White's now, had I a couple. I can't White's go back couple. and review every single, but I don't think they've done that really at all. Yeah. It doesn't feel no. Like- well, no, I don't think we're trying. I don't think this is. We run like I think the Celtics have been pretty good at running off turnovers, like because I think it's been drilled into them, like run off turnovers, right? Mm-hmm. But I I just think that like we saw the Bucks do this to the Celtics a bit too, where they were like run, trying to run on makes. It's yeah, like yeah. I think the book is sort of out on the Celtics that like they're they're like transitions from offense to deep. Like if if you play against them in the half court, it's not going to go well for you. But if you can like if you can play against them in transition, maybe it's a little better or like, and I think it works the other way. I think the, I think teams know like the heat get to conserve some energy too. When the Celtics walk the ball up the court, like I think these teams like they don't even have to worry about like, about like a point guard for the Celtics sprinting the ball up the court, you know, like it's it's just never, it's never going to happen. And Pritchard's good at that too, of like pushing the ball and pushing the pace. And Pritchard, this is goes back to he made Pritchard gets four minutes in game six. Yep. Now yep. I know they're trying to 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 play the matchups and like sometimes when Pritchard's on the court, he gets targeted. But at some point, like you need a spark, you need some energy. And Pritchard always kind of brings that. He's the guy that pushes off makes um and and will find the way to dr- like it, it, as much as dribbling has been a problem for Boston in the series. He's one of the few guys that is at least willing and able to dribble into the teeth of the defense, not cough it up, and then try and figure something out as he gets there. So maybe that's something they think about for game seven is maybe maybe giving Pritchard a little bit of a longer leaf to try and give them some energy. Um, and, and I do think – I think you're right. I think he gets them into their – I think Pritchard gets them into their offense earlier than other guys. And I think, you know, you can't – like the space that he provides is yeah. – 
um, is incredibly valuable. The defensive part, I don't know. I've got a lot of theories about this too. And I think it's a little overrated. Like, but how, um, much, how much of the defensive stuff changes when they don't have Rob? That's it. Right. It's like, like Rob is so huge in this series. Cause there's all these, play, like, because Miami plays these lineups without like, um, you know, uh, Milwaukee would play lineups where there are four shooters on the court, right? Like it plus Giannis. So like, you're worrying about everybody. The, the heat aren't really like that. Like you do worry about PJ Tucker shooting threes in the corner, but Rob is so good at closing out. We saw him block a corner three on a closeout the other night. Like the most ridiculous block that only Rob could, or Rob and Giannis could only, only two people in basketball that could have done that. And in game and in game five, there was all the successful stuff, like having Rob guard Jimmy and like, I don't know. Maybe that doesn't work in a game where Jimmy is like got smoke coming out of his ears, but like the, to your point about Rob, I do think like um, this team, this, this Celtics team is at its most sort of like incendiary when he gets to like roam around off, like not guard the ball and not guard the paint, like, and be like um, on like, for example, guarding Tucker, who's just standing in the corner and getting to like roam and muck stuff up and then make your close out. If you have to like, that's like the Celtics most beautiful Rob stuff. I just think the whole, like, I don't really, it, this may sound nuts, but like, after the game Jimmy just had, but like, I'd rather see them try to like attack mismatches than like get their sort of like ball movement machine working and, and end up with like bam getting dunks or Struess getting threes. And like, I think that's when they're at their most dangerous. Like, I think I don't think it's the 47 points from Butler that killed the Celtics in that game. I think it's like the four threes from Lowry and like the, I well, don't know. I, I disagree with that. Yeah. I was going to save this. Um, at the end of the day, game six is a Celtics loss because Jimmy Butler was literally unbelievable. Um, it's 47, eight and eight. It's hard to argue against this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And like, I knew they were in trouble when Jimmy hit his first three. I was like, Oh, and they had another one. I was like, Oh man, it's going to be the night. Cause like Jimmy will have a night. Like he was, I forget what was like one for 27 in the playoffs or whatever, whatever the number was, it was outrageous. But even Jimmy knew, like, I got to hit some threes tonight. Like yeah. they're not, they are not respecting my three shot at all. If we're going to win this game, I have to knock down a couple cause it might make life easier for me. But Jimmy was absolutely unbelievable in this game. And, and like, even some of the shots he made were over tough defense. And you're like, what else can you do? Yeah, that's Drew, kind of what I mean. It's not Drew's that I, a couple of tough shots. You're like, what else do you want them to do? Like, what else? Like, sometimes they just, the team hits a tough shot. And Jimmy yeah. had a one. The Grant Williams foul where they challenged the foul call. Like mm. Jimmy, like Jimmy threw a laser at the rim, like just a laser, and it went in. It, I was like, I was like, what? This is just the night. Like Jimmy hit so many tough shots, and and as much as it's it's frustrating, I actually find it easier to come to grips with when it's like, you know what? He just hit a bunch of tough shots, and Boston didn't, and that's how it goes. Jimmy hit, I would say, at least seven or eight or nine really difficult shots. And the worst one was to turn around with 2.4 on the shot clock at with under a minute to go. And it was yeah. like, yep, that's, that's it right there. That's exactly like what, what else? There were two guys there. It's like whenever Boston plays, and this is why I was thrilled that Dallas is not going to the finals <laughs> because I am so sick and tired of Luca burying buzzer beating shots with Tatum's hand in his face fade away at the buzzer to win games. Like, I'm so sick and tired of that already. Jimmy just hit a bunch of tough shots. Larry hit a couple of tough shots. Struess hit a couple of tough shots. Like that's just totally just, just sucks because you play really great defense and normally you're rewarded with a rebound. And even in these tough times, like just, they didn't, the, Miami just hit a couple of tough shots and Boston didn't. And that was it. Like there's so many in a tight game like that, you can break down every single play, but yet like, they hit tough shots. Boston didn't. You can analyze every single shot, but at the end of the day, 
sometimes that's what it is. And I know there are certain stats that would like, no, no, I'm not, I wouldn't even disagree. I, I, I just would say that like, um, I think to your point, um, I think there's this thing that happens where like great players make shots over a tough defense. And, and we think like, I, I guess I would just say like, if that's the reason you're not playing Pritchard, I I'm kind of questioning that. Like, um, can like, if they really want to like go out of their offense to just go one-on-one against like you're helping against Butler anyway, we're like, you're sending help and you're giving up open looks kind of anyway. And so like, um, if it helps you get some more minutes for smart on the bench, or if it helps you, like, if, if you need more offense, you need more space for, I mean, God, like they can't dribble. There's no space out there you need more space for Tatum and Brown to be able to drive it help. It might help to have Pritchard like open on the strong side. I, I just think like, um, he's not, he's not such a terrible defender that I'm afraid of letting him like guard somebody one-on-one a little bit, but game seven, Sunday night, eight 30. going to be a stressful 24 hours. Cause it's <laughs> almost eight o'clock Eastern time right now. So it's about 24 hours out. Sometimes these games feel so stressful that it's hard to even decide if it's fun. It's like, am I even having fun right now watching this game? Like, I'm just terrified. None of these games are fun. Unless you're winning by 20, then they're fun. Because we we need to have like a therapist on to figure out why we do this to ourselves. Like, because it's out of our control. That's (laughs) But game seven, 830 ESPN. Again, if you're like me and hate the fact that it takes till 845 to tip the ball off, you can watch at 845. Um, or 840, and then yeah. a couple of minutes of BS, but whatever. One of the things we talked about extensively in this podcast, the offensive rebounding numbers. Yes. One of the things that I would like Boston to do in game seven is, first off, cut down on the offensive rebounding numbers for Miami. Okay, secure the defensive rebound. Yes. But in conjunction with that, I want them to push – on that because it's clear that Miami is sending everybody to the glass. Very clear, very evident that everybody has been told to follow your shot on Miami because how many guys have shot the ball? Obviously it doesn't even matter if they know if it's going in or not, but they're just crashing automatically. And there's just more guys around the basket than Boston has. There's two or three guys down low for Boston. There's five for Miami. Miami wins numbers battle. And they get a good look. As you talked about earlier, the, you know, the, 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 the shot after an offensive rebound, you know, you talk about the numbers with Boston and being, yeah. slow. I bet Miami's, if you looked that up is much quicker, they're uh, faster. They're much, much faster because they're getting great looks at the rim because they have somebody there probably un, uncontested grabbing the rebound and putting it back in. One of the things that I hope Boston does for game seven is find a way to secure defensive possessions with rebounds and then push off those rebounds because you're going to have the numbers advantage on the other side. When you look at the series and all the wacky things that have happened in the series, if you can find a way to steal points, yep, I mean, steal points, take every single opportunity. And this is one of the ways I think Boston has really come up short here by allowing so many offensive rebounds, A, but B, the fact that they, again, they just don't push enough. And if they can find a way to push off these, you know, these defensive possessions, you're going to have numbers. And if you have guys leaking out and not everybody, maybe one guy, maybe it's just one guy, you send four, they send five. You have one guy cherry picking with the, 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 uh, the the Vec offense. This is exactly what the Vec pictured (laughs) when he bought the Sacramento Kings years ago. I forgot about that. This is, this is you dust off the Vivek playbook and you, and you try and do this because there's an advantage there that Miami is is succeeding to you. They under Miami's half court offense for the most part, isn't that great when Boston has their set defense. Okay. That's right. They don't have any, they don't have that many offense creators. So if you have everybody crash in the glass, you have a numbers advantage. Take advantage of that number. Seth, am I crazy? No, you're, you're making total sense. And I think, you know, <laughs> not for nothing, the fact that the last two games of the series have been the ones where Miami has been pounding the offensive glass, like the hardest, like that 33 and that 33% number we were talking about before. Um, I think it has some like um, series become like series are all about adjustments, but also you become like more yourself over the course of a series. And if, if the heat have learned over the course of six games that the Celtics are just going to walk the ball up the court every time, they're not going to be afraid 
at going hog wild, trying to get offensive rebounds, right? Like it, it frees them up. It frees them up mentally to do that. The, the other piece of it though, is that this is one of those areas of basketball where it is like, it's not just shooting luck. It's like, it is like how well you play. Like boxing out is just like a thing you could do. And the, the rebounds that the heat are getting like PJ Tucker most famously is great at this, but like the, the corner crash. So like, when a, when a shooter in the corner um, has been like maybe largely ignored for a whole offensive possession. And then the shot goes up that corner shooter, like will go crash the glass. Cause that's the guy who wouldn't be back on defense anyway. Right. Like it's, yeah. it's the safest place to crash from. So I think like that we just have like Jalen or Derek white or whoever it is, who's guarding that corner shooter that has to be a box out. And that's like a thing you can do. You can just do that better. Right. It's yeah. like, it's not like it's you don't have to worry PJ. about like a shot going in or not. You just do that better. Especially if it's PJ because PJ a is really P I, I, I love PJ Tucker. I'm not gonna lie. I'm actually, I'm, I'm a big fan. Um, he knows what he's good at. And he's a, he knows what he's not good at. If he catches the ball at three point line, that's on the corner that he's, that he's not shooting it. He just knows he's not shooting it. But if PJ's in the corner, in the ball, and you know you have PJ, and I know it's hard. Like, I know this is hard. If it's it hard. Easy, everybody would do it. So yeah. I'm not trying to say this isn't easy. This isn't, this is easy. It's not. Yeah. But you have to find a way. It's like in baseball. In baseball, you're always thinking about a million things at the same time. But you have dead time to think about them. In yep. basketball, you just don't because the ball is always moving around. But if you can find a way to think, hey, if you have PJ corner in the t- in the corner, if PJ's in the corner, if the shot goes up, put a body on him e- because you know he's going to crash. And because PJ is big and physical, it has no problem throwing people around because he's strong. If you the earlier you get a body on him and put him off course, and I don't care if it's a bump into the baseline or if it's like literally just putting you him up and walling him off, that's going to mean a whole lot. Like if Struess is crashing or if it's Martin crashing or if it's Lowry, like whatever, but PJ and bam can give them so many more, so much better chance. And then the way, because they're so big and physical, they can go up strong and either get to the line or, or finish through the contact like bam, because he's athletic grabs a rebound and yeah. gets to the top of guys. PJ is more of a guy that just barrels through, finds a way to grab it and then like creates contact going up or maybe finds an open shooter somewhere. Cause PJ's again, a smart guy. Well, and it's, it's also the price you pay. Like you try to, as a, when you're on defense in the NBA, every team does this, but the, they try to have certain things they don't have to think about. Like you want to have, there be like a couple shooters. You don't have to pay as much attention to because then you get to like, worry about the guys who are more worth worrying about like Jimmy Butler or whatever. But part of the price you pay from, for ignoring PJ Tucker in the corner is that PJ Tucker comes and kills you on the offensive glass. Like, um, I mean, I'm thinking back to like last year's playoffs when he was with Milwaukee, but when Atlanta would try to like hide Trey young on PJ Tucker and it sounds great. Like while you're playing defense, right. It's like, Oh, they can't, they're not going to bring PJ Tucker up in a screen. We can keep Trey young out of the play, but then all of a sudden a shot goes up and Trey young is trying to box out PJ Tucker and that's not good. And so like, in, at least that's a situation where he, he could like, he could try and still fail. Probably the Celtics, if the Celtics box him out, it'll work. Like it, it's not like, um, he won't be able to overpower these guys. Like if they actually put a body on him. Yeah. And with Boston, you know, you talk about the turnovers. That's mm. the the biggest thing. I yep. mean, if they box out and limit Miami on the offensive glass, get out and run. Yep. And don't turn the ball over. I don't do, think it's really that complicated. I think they do. Win. Do we sound like we're dreaming here? Is this like this is just us like fantasizing at this well, point? I yeah, because it's probably not going to – I mean, this is a credit to Miami too, though. I do want to I do want to take some time just for a second. Miami defensively is really in the dribble. Like when Jalen or Tatum or Smart or anybody puts the ball on the floor, yep, they get into guys. I am very impressed about everything they've done and to try yep. and disrupt the dribble penetration of Boston more so on just like the first dribble or two. 
and everybody's doing it. It's Gabe Vincent. It's 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 a, a lot of Victor Oladipo's done a great job with it. PJ Tucker's done a good job with it. Uh, Jimmy's done a good job. I mean, they they have guys that've done an amazing job at just getting in the airspace of guys, and especially when that first dribble goes on the floor, they just attack, and it's just really impressive. But if Boston can avoid those turnovers, and it's been hard for them to do, credit to my again. The, the one thing that like people just stop turning the ball over, like, well, the reason why they turn the ball over is because Miami's good at this. Okay, yeah, no. Miami is really good at this. They've they've obviously scouted Boston really well and decided, you know what, this is something we can exploit right here. They're lazy with their first couple of dribbles, or, or well, I mean, I, that must be the scouting report. I mean, I, I don't I don't know what Spolster's cooking up, but that must be what they've been thinking about. I think it's, I think it's more that I think it, it, I think it's actually about the, like getting into the offense late piece that I, that that's why I'm harping on that so much. I think when you, if that first dribble is coming with like 18 or 19 seconds on the shot clock, they, they don't, they can't be as aggressive because there's too much time left for the Celtics to pass it around when they close up. If it's, even if it's like happening at 13 or 14 seconds, they can be so much more aggressive. And I think, I really think that's a huge piece of it. The other thing is like the Celtics have, uh, Ime has talked a big game about getting these guys to pass the ball more, right? Like the ball movement thing has been a thing he's harped on all year. And like to Tatum's credit, he's like, I think he's become like a beautiful passer over the course of the season. But there is this thing where it's like a little bit like what Luca does, where it's like um, he's trying to control everything and that, his pass will be the pass that leads to the shot. But I think you have to just like make life easier. Throw uh, instead of throwing one great pass for a shot, just throw four or five, like get it going back and forth, left to right. Like, um, and I think that's one of the things that Al, like I love when Al catches the ball at the top of the key, because he just immediately looks the other way and moves it to the other side. And there's no reason it doesn't like, it that that's not the moment where the good Flip stuff it, happens, just, but it, you, you stretch like the defense is stretched. They can't be as aggressive on the next dribble that happens. It, it changes everything. And I think that's what I'm looking for in game seven. If, if like, if I see early on that the Celtics are getting the ball moving side to side, like, even if they're having like not great shooting luck, I feel good that like, they will get shots instead of turnovers. And if they get shots instead of turnovers, the math will work in their favor eventually. Right. And it's and sometimes it's more, and Tatum has gotten good at this and Van Gundy has pointed this out about Tatum, just dis- making decisions quicker, getting off it quicker, get off it quicker. And just and like, you see double coming, move it. And what Tatum has done a really nice job of lately is relocating after he gets off it. Yeah. Moving around and then find a way to come like this. Like, that's what makes Steph so amazing. Yep. Steph never stops moving. He's that's right. always perpetual. He's always in motion, no matter where he is. So if you can find a in, in again, Tatum's good at this, get off it quick, relocate. And I think you're right on that. I think Tatum is trying to make the pass instead of just passing to move. Yeah. I think there's a good distinction with that. Whether they know. And, and I don't even blame him. It's like, there's so much of the offense is his responsibility. Like, and I'm sure he feels like if he doesn't get guys shots, they won't get good shots. But I think like my, that's what Miami's taking away. Right. Is like, you, you're not, you can't just drive into two or three of those guys and hope that you're going to be able to kick it out. They're just too good. Like Lowry and Oladipo and Butler, these aren't guys you can just like, dribble into a crowd against. So I think it just has to be more easy passes. And I'll just say this because I just, I had it marked down here um, as the thing, because you look at the three point shooting, you know, by game for Miami, you know, the games they shoot relatively well above yeah. 30%, you know, in game one, they're 10 to 30. That's a win. They're 11 to 33 in game three. That's a win. They're 15 of 35 from three. That's a win. And again, some of them is, you know, Jimmy hitting threes the first time in the series. And Kyle Lowry, instead of going 0 of 6, is hitting threes this series. You know, in the center of the backcourt going, what was it, 1 for 28 or whatever the number was in games 4 and 5? That uh, a hilarious number. Those um, shooting numbers from those two games for Miami are absolutely wow. wild. It's hilarious. 7 of 45 from 3 in game 5, which is conical. Um, but if you can find a way to shut them off from 3, 
that's going to be, you know, a big thing. I think, so my question is, even with Jimmy heating up, I, you still just sag off him from three to say, hey, Jimmy, if you're going to beat us two games in a row, hit three pointers. Bye, yeah, bye. Get I do. I do. I hate to agree with like, like to keep bringing up the TV announcers, but I kind of agree with the point Mark Jackson was making that these, they can't just be practice shots. Like that's fair. It can't be Jimmy like walking into a three pointer with nobody even remotely close to him. That's yeah. He, he like used to be a good three. I I feel like there's something fishy with Jimmy Butler's three point shooting. I feel like he like, does it. He's like, it's like a playoff trick or something. Like he doesn't do it in the regular <laughs> Unless season. Unless he really needs it. <laughs> He's like playing possum or something. Like, I don't know what's going on with the Jimmy Butler three pointers, but yeah. I, I know that he's not as bad as he's seemed in the regular season. He just, he just doesn't take them. Yeah. Because he doesn't take them. You just assume he's bad at it. Well, the percentages are terrible too, but, uh, but like, no, t- I mean, I do think like, when that guy rises up and fires in the playoffs, I'm terrified. Oh my god! Again, I will. I'll have nightmares of Game Six. Yeah, I mean, he hit a bunch of tough ones too. It's not like he hit easy ones. He was Jimmy was unbelievable. Well, I don't know if the threes were tough, but no, the, he, the, the, but, a lot of the other stuff was. No, those long twos, man. He, yeah. I was, and that's the thing. Like I was watching the game, and I'm like, you kind of want Jimmy to shoot long twos, but he's also like good at it. So I don't, yeah. I don't know, I. I think they played great defense on Jimmy. I think he had a great night. And I think if you duplicate it again and he beats you again, man, you just tip your cap because he's just an excellent player. But I, mm. it's, this is tough. This is, it's this is tough. tough. It's really tough. These two teams are both very good defensively, two really good coaches. Um, they're both. And the thing is this health thing is killing me. Is it because yeah. I want, here's what, here's my big question. Will Ime let Rob play more than like 20 minutes? Yeah. Because they've been very, and I, we've talked about this in the group chat and I've talked about it with other people. I do think Rob is in this like very weird break in case of emergency place. Yeah. Because I do think they're trying to manage Rob's long-term health here. But at a, at a certain point, I do think you're just going to have to go all out and I, and, and credit to both teams. And this is so, you know, like this is such a fair, I, I don't give, I don't, I don't care. Both of these teams are playing through an insane amount of injuries that you would not play through during the regular season. That's right. Insane. This is unbelievable. I do think, I mean, the question for me is, will he play Rob more than he wants to? Hmm. Because yeah, it'll be Rob, interesting to see. Rob is the if if Rob Rob is the, what breaks everything. Like no no, how poor Bam has played in the series. It is not a, is not a coincidence. You know what he is? He, he's like he's the um. I was talking about improvisation earlier as like the way you attack a defense. Like that you, you need to be able to improvise to attack a defense that's set against you like this. Rob is improvisation like personified. Yeah. Everything that dude does on both he's ends of the court. Jazz, baby. That's what yeah. Rob Williams is. He's beautiful. He's like jazz. he on defense, the chaos home. he brings is amazing. But on offense, like the passes that he considers throwing and like the the like weird angles he sets picks at and like all also the, the all, also the gravity of him just being around the rim and just like throw it up and he'll just get it. Like, I mean, the, I, he just, he out jumps. Every, he just yeah. goes forever. It's amazing. The offensive rebounding. I mean, he just like adds this whole element of like unpredictability that I think is so important. And that's where I think he final card is mm-hmm. because more again, Rob, both of these coaches, I, again, I have so much respect for Spo. It's unbelievable. Um, I think they've both been saving stuff. And I think Ime has one more card to play. And I think it's, we're just going to play Rob more. And I love it. Good luck. And I don't, I don't know if they'll do it because I, I, I just, I'm curious at what Rob's pain management level is. I don't know anything. I don't, I don't know how hurt he is. I know he's hurt. It's clear he's hurt. I don't know how hurt he is. I don't know what his knee feels like. I have no idea, but if they decide that this is it and they play Rob 25, 30 minutes, that might be what it takes to get this done because Miami is just relentless at certain things. And especially, and you can see the problems that Rob creates very easily when he's on the floor. It's like, yep. they like, 
they have so much stuff to already think about. And as you, as, as we talked about the scale thing of like, Oh, Miami wants you to do this. And then they have the guy there to meet you because they wanted to do that. They, they, Rob breaks all of it, all of it. And can I, can I ask you a question about your emotions right now, heading into game seven? Sure. Okay. So like we you lost, check? well, we, uh, and when I say we, I mean the Celtics, um, in, to, in 2020 in the bubble, this is the team we lost to. And it like, at the time it felt like a missed opportunity a little bit, but it also felt like this, we're not ready. We're clearly not ready. These like, this heat team is like a bunch of pros and like, um, you know, we just didn't have it. Like when it came down to like clutch moments in that series, we just weren't there. So what I'm wondering is like, to what degree, obviously this would be a bigger missed opportunity, but like how much bigger is what I'm wondering. (laughs) Like, like how are we going to sleep at night if they, if we lose this game seven? Scotch will help. <laughs> Did I break you? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, because this it's health a big... thing is this health thing is killing me. I know, I know. And, well, and and like I do think there's like the sports fan in me. There's like a there's a part of me that wants to be like graceful about this and be like, this season has given me so much more joy already yeah. Yeah. than I ever thought I was getting out of it. You Especially know, when it started like we got, I feel like we got a coach now. I feel like we got a defense that I love watching. I feel like we have like star players that we get to like be excited about. There's so much to root for. They're all young. Like, yeah, but it's a but blown opportunity because you huge blown opportunity. You don't get here. The thing that I'll tell this is the thing. Any, and, and if any, who, Whoever wants to say this piece, oh, you won the title when everybody got hurt. Let me tell you something. Uh Uh-uh. You don't get here that often, okay? It doesn't happen all the time unless you're LeBron or the Warriors, okay? Every time you get this close and don't get to the finals, it is a missed opportunity. How big that is? That's, a, you know, pending where you are in development. When Boston got to the finals against LeBron in games or Eastern Conference finals against LeBron in game seven, that was a, holy cow, I can't believe they're here. Like, this is crazy. It's game yes. seven, LeBron, Tatum's like 19, like whatever, roll the ball out. Who cares? Like, we're playing with house money. Uh, who cares? Yeah, it was all gravy. Didn't matter. It was like, the, if they the fact that we're even here is incredible. It's like Atlanta. Right. Atlanta has this amazing run and everybody's feeling great. And it's like, holy cow, the fact they're here, this is crazy. Oh my God. Then you have this season. Yeah. And Atlanta has a lot more problems and questions to ask themselves at the end of the season than they did the year prior. It was like, yeah. oh, Atlanta's great. Cam Reddish, John Collins, Trey Young. They have to see what they do. Guess what? Didn't go as well, right? Whenever you get to this spot, if you do not make the finals, it is a missed opportunity, especially when there's so many injuries on either side. Yep. What helps our case is that Jason Tatum is still 24 and Jalen Brown is still 25. Yeah. However, they've had, they've gotten here already so many times. Yep. You have to eventually get over that hump and championship teams do. Championship teams go on the road and win game seven in a do or die game. I love, go ahead. I love what you're saying. And it, it, it's reminding me of what Spo said after game five, uh, after, yeah, after game five, when he like in the press conference, he almost seemed a little excited when they asked him like how you recover from this. He's like, we, we like, we have an opportunity like to win the championship. You have to do like really difficult stuff. And like, and if we win these next two games, it becomes this, like, we're going to be like so proud of ourselves for years about like, and it, like the stories we'll have to tell about how we went through this thing. Like I'm paraphrasing what he said, but that's the idea. Right. But like that I'm hoping like, 
I, you know, I think I can't, I think I texted you guys like watching Derek white run out of the tunnel for game six. Like he was, he looked like giddy. And I, I was like, man, this guy's going to have a good game tonight. And like, and he did. And I just hope this is what I hope. I hope the Celtics go into game seven feeling like, Holy crap. We have this amazing opportunity in front of us and not like, Holy crap. If we no, blow no. this, yeah. we're like, we're like, a, it's, it's shame. Two different mindsets. Yeah. Really quick before predictions. Yeah. Okay. Two things. And I said, we were going to talk about this pre-show and I <laughs> have not talked about this until now. Uh, I totally forgot. Two things. One, this $25,000 fine on the Miami bench means absolutely nothing. And I don't, I can't even believe they even slapped a fine on that because Miami will pay that every single time. They're going to keep doing that. The $25,000 fine. And I'm not trying to say both teams don't try and do this, but Miami is clearly taking liberties with this. And it's starting to really get to me. Yeah. There's got to be if, if, and we'll see what, what, what the referee crew looks like. And I have a seizing suspicion. One of my favorite guys <clears throat> is going to be ref in this game. I just that they're gonna keep doing that. Yeah. Unless somebody comes out and, and tees them up. And I it, that that stuff, the Nick Nurse thing, Nick Nurse does this and it drives me absolutely crazy. You have to clear out that stuff. You have to. You just you can't have like all right, the, the shot of smart being guarded by like seven people in the corner. Like, dude, come on. Like you have to find a way to regulate that. I'm not trying to yeah. complain too much about that because it what the game was not about that but that that stuff and i got i can't swear that stuff needs to stop that stuff needs to stop i mean it's been a problem throughout the playoffs i mean dallas got fined for this a few times and like you know there's screen there's screenshots you can find of the celtics guys on the court too it what what's wild to me is like the the play where i forget is it horford shooting a three or Mar- yeah. marcus is shooting a three markeith morris has both his feet in bounds like the on the court it's like this is just, and he's like right next to him. It's like, they do have to figure something out. And I kind of, I'm sure like, you know, we're not like breaking news here. The NBA is paying attention to this, but I wonder, I wonder when they're going to do something about it. Cause it is becoming a big deal. The unfortunate part is Zach Zarba is not there to make a big spectacle out of all of <laughs> because you know, he would do so. <laughs> My I prediction mean, about that though. Guy, but like, he's the, he's the over explainer that kills. Yeah. Him. And I just I don't think it's going to be game seven when the league decides to do something about this issue. No, no absolutely not. No way. Um, and if you have any sanity, do not read the last two minute report of the of game. <laughs> just don't do that. I do. I do suspect that everybody's favorite referee, Kane Fitzgerald, will be doing this game. Yeah. I just have, and it, and and I'm and I'm just, and, and I don't mean to be this guy, but like he just makes every call about Kane Fitzgerald. It is unbelievable and though and the problem is it will disrupt the rhythm of this game yep i the one prediction i have and it will be right this game will have no flow this game will have <laughs> zero flow it just won't and, and that's what's gonna stink about tomorrow is this game or today if anyone doesn't listen to this podcast this game will have absolutely zero flow to it and i yeah. and i'm like i would if there's a way to bet that i would put my house on it there's it's the- zero flow it's the classic game seven way. And, and like, yeah, it's, and Why these games te- are usually better because yeah. game seven is usually just a disaster. The also, game- these two teams are like, are begging for like weird refereeing nights, like with the way they play. So it's like, I mean, listen, game six, I felt like it was a travesty too, but um, you know, game seven is going to be a wild ride. It's going to probably be a rock fight. That's right. Yep. So Seth, as we do mm. on game days, we'll do a little early here. How's the vibes check? How we doing? How we feeling? You know, I, w- I was arguing with your co-host, uh, Adam Kaufman about this, like after game six, cause like he's so optimistic and like, he was sort of like still freaking out. I think after game six, by the time the second half of game six was in progress, I was already getting like, excited about game set. Like I'm, I'm in the SPO mode of like, I'm excited about this opportunity. Like this is our chance to like, um, yet again, at, like after games five and six, uh, six and seven against the bucks, this is, a, this is like the Celtics chance to like have a really prideful moment leading into the finals where they like, they do 
what is expected of them. I am a little nervous of the fact that they're considered favorites in this game. Like that doesn't quite seem right to me, but I'm, I'm psyched. Let's see what happens. Somebody do me a favor. Don't talk to Draymond Green, please, yeah. for this game. Didn't do, and that's so great. That's so funny that people make a big deal out of that. It's like if that's what it took to get this Miami Heat team fired up, then I'm just I'm, I question the Miami Heat culture in general. Also, it's like Udonis Haslam's fired up. Do we know if anyone else was fired up about this? Yeah, I, uh, I guess Dwayne Dedman made a hand, might have had something <laughs> to do with it. I don't know, yeah. but I will say this. Uh huh. This will not be harder than walking into Game Six of Milwaukee and trying to take Giannis out of do or die game. No, that is the hardest thing they've had to accomplish. Now, this is a whole different circumstance. I don't I just don't love it because we have so much prior history. Of not great things happening, but if that, build, that building is a house of horrors. It's true. No, yeah. but it's the poetic like justice of this setup is interesting and to be able to extinguish different flames along the way here Mm. brooklyn milwaukee and then miami finally feels a little weird um but i i i think you're right with the there is a different attitude when you when it's winter go home and i think we saw that um last series with like, Hey, it's, it's do or die against Giannis here. Like everybody's got to step up. Yep. The problem with this again is health. Yep. But this team has not lost two games in a row this entire playoffs. So with that in mind, I will finish my scotch (laughs) and I will roll with the C's. Yeah. I'm taking them too. I can't believe I'm saying it out loud, but I'm taking them. I feel terrible about this. This is why I'm drinking Scott. But I like their, this is Celtics beat. So uh, I like their odds. I like their shot. Um, this is a, this is a big moment though. This is a. Gigantic. If, especially in it, in it's, it's, and it's really big for Tatum, obviously Brown, obviously. But it's really big for smart because this is the the last of the OGs here of the yep. uh, of the of the 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 the, the aftertime of the of the KG Paul Pierce Ray Allen stuff. He was the, jo- the Jordan Crawford years. Do it for Jordan Mickey, guys. Do it for Jordan Mickey. Do it for you know Phil Pressy. Yeah, flip. You know, do it. Do it for Shane Larkin and <laughs> Kelly Olynyk and Evan Turner. And Amir Johnson. Yeah. All the guys that led to this point. Like that's that's powerful stuff. And, and maybe that only rings with Marcus, because Marcus is the only guy that's been around. Maybe that's what you gotta do to Mark. Like, hey Marcus, we're gonna do this tonight. We're doing this for Jordan Mickey, James Young. We're doing this for Phil Pressy, Shane Larkin, you know, uh RJ Hunter. You know, we're doing <laughs> we can do it for all. That's all right. And that's and I don't know. There's some some beautiful poetic justice in that, but at the same time, Miami will rip the heart out of you. So I, you know, well, I'm great about it. <laughs> one one more piece of poetry. I, sure. The guy I'm thinking about going into Game Seven is actually Horford, who has who has played. They pointed this out in the broadcast. He's played more playoff games than anyone ever without playing in the finals. Like that dude has been in the playoffs like almost every year of his career. Right. And I just would love to see him get a chance. Like. I, I would love one of the best things if the Celtics can like by some miracle win the title this year is that like, I really think I would love to see Horford get his number retired someday. You know, like I just, well, I love the, I love the guy. I think he's had an incredible career. He's been underrated all along the way and I hope they make it to the finals for him. Yeah. And obviously the, there was a, there was a death in the Horford family. I think yeah he about it and obviously best of the Horford family going through some stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just been kind of a do it for Al sort of run, you know? Yeah. Um, and I would, again, that's a crazy stat that Al Horford has played more games than anybody in the history of the league without getting the NBA finals, playoff games, playoff games, yeah. without getting the NBA finals. 
Yeah, that's that's big time too. There's a lot at stake here, and uh, it should be a fun night. Try to enjoy yourselves, pace yourselves if you're indulging in anything. Uh, Water is a good way to to help with that. Um, space it out. Space it out. Um, we'll learn this together. Um, but I think I've turned it around to the point like this is going to be fun because like this is why you watch. This is why you spend every in October. This yep. is why I watch summer league basketball. And yep. love that. This is why you tune in in October, November. You watch you watch it for this. And there's something beautiful about that as we talk about, you know, like why do we do this to ourselves? Like, I don't know, there's something beautiful about watching and getting invested in something that's out of your control and 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 like de- develop in relationships with people you don't know <laughs> over time. I don't know. I I just tomorrow it's amazing. It'll, it'll be interesting. And I I know everybody's nervous. I think everybody involved is nervous, maybe except for Jimmy Butler. Um, but it'll be fun. It'll be enjoyable and, and, and we'll see, hopefully we have a NBA finals preview coming at you next time. We'll see. And the coffin will be back. Seth Landman, absolutely wonderful stuff. We went an hour and a half. This is not, I did not expect this. I'm just trying to get this to like 45 minutes. Oh my God. So we went way long, but it's a lot to talk about. It's game seven. Everybody's jacked up. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, on Stitcher, on YouTube. Uh, our CLS media channel has been killing it. Uh, the post game shows are racking up 30, 40, 50,000 views within 24 hours. Obviously those guys are doing a hell of a job, uh, between Bobby Manning, John Zanis. Uh, you have, uh, I'm, this, this is going to be terrible because I'm just thinking of I, Jimmy, uh, what the hell is ever Jimmy's last name is. It's going to bother me, but I, I, I just, my brain is scattered in so many directions. So I they're doing a great job. They're doing a great job. All of them. I'm, seriously, I, I, the fact that I haven't been on that show yet, it's kind of, uh, interesting, but, um, it's cause I'm too tired after games to do any of that stuff, uh, unless it's the NBA finals, but those guys are killing it. Make sure you follow them for the land, man. I'm Evan. We're out of Thanks, Scott. man. We got to go. Game seven. Game seven. Love you guys.